Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you are deciding to watch this video. And I just hope that the Lord's been good to you this week, and wondering how you're doing with this shelter-in-place situation. It's only been a little over a week, but it seems like a long time to me. I uh, would love to hear from you via email, phone, text, or joining our Zoom chat at 1130 Sunday morning. We will send out invitations and you can join our Bethany Fellowship Zoom chat. And all you have to do is install the Zoom app on your phone or computer. And then when you get the link in the email, just click on that link and it should let you join. You know, and click on that you want to enable your audio and video and you can join us. So... What have been some of your high points and low points this week as we shelter in place? For us, I guess some of the low points are we've had to cancel our vacation to Cozumel, and I know a lot of you have canceled trips as well, and we also had to cancel all our short-term trips at Chris Star, including my trip to Japan in June. I know Derek's trip is also postponed until the fall to Japan. So I know a lot of us have had to cancel plans for travel. And some of the high points are I am getting more sleep, less stress, getting a few things done around the house, getting out on more walks with Jan, who by the way is my audience of one this morning, my live audience of one person, but she won't let me turn the video on her. And uh we are, <clears throat> we are enjoying that part of it, but probably the most difficult part is not seeing you all and not being able to give you hugs and see our family and give them hugs. We did see, see our kids and grandkids yesterday while we delivered fresh baked bread and had to keep our six foot distance outside the door. So it's not quite the same as we uh, usually are hugging and running and playing with our grandkids. So I hope that the Lord is taking care of you, and we need to keep praying that the Lord will bring us through this affliction. I know yesterday I was thinking that we were doing pretty good in Santa Barbara. The number of cases was not rising very fast, but then it jumped by 15 overnight. So now we're up to 47 cases in Santa Barbara County. So we need to still be vigilant and careful, even though we want to see you all as soon as possible. Well, getting on to the message, the, uh, the elders and uh, Mariko and Derek and I discussed about topics for the year. And remember, we talked about answering some of the difficult questions that unbelievers would ask. And when I was in the Nichigo Bible study group, they asked me to consider talking about why did Jesus have to die such a violent death? Why did he have to die at all is what some people will ask, and others will say, well, why did it have to be so violent? And, you know, if God is able to do anything, can do the impossible, why couldn't he just say, well, I forgive you, and why did he have to let anyone die, and especially Jesus? And these are good questions, and so... <clears throat> This message is kind of an equipping question for you because I think in these times people are going to be thinking more about what what is going on and how they are not in control of their lives. As the one doctor said, you know, we don't we don't control the timeline on this epidemic the virus does and it's out of our control and except that we can be careful in our uh, contact with others and keeping our hands clean and things like that. But reality is it's out of our control and people are probably going to be more willing to hear about eternal things as the weeks drag on. And so this is an equipping time to answer that tough question. Why did Jesus have to die such a violent death? <clears throat> Well, the passage today is taken from Galatians. Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians around 480, uh, 48 AD. And the Galatian church was located in present-day Turkey. 
and that the people in that church were Gentiles who had become believers, but they were falling back into thinking that they had to follow the old Jewish laws, the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, in order to be saved and sanctified. And Paul wrote this letter to explain to them why Jesus had to die and why we are saved by faith in Jesus and not in the Old Testament works of the law. So, first of all, let's look at why did Jesus have to die. Throughout the Bible, it says the penalty of sin is death, and it also says that God cannot lie. The Bible says that God is just, and he will punish sin. And even though he loves his creation, he loves you and me, he also cannot let sin go unpunished. <clears throat> and he can't lie. Once he said the penalty of sin is death, there had to be death. So, the story began in Genesis 2 and 3 when the Lord said to Adam, uh, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. <clears throat> well, I thought about uh, how we discipline our children and how we tell them that there's a penalty if they disobey. For instance, if you tell your child, if he throws food, he's going to get spanked and go to bed without any dinner or dessert. And so about halfway through the meal, your child gets mad, picks up his plate, and throws it across the kitchen. Food flies everywhere. And so you count to 10 so that you don't erupt after you calm down, you tell them, well, you're going to have to have a spanking, and then you're going to your room, and you're not getting any more food tonight. And you love your son, and you hate to see him suffer, but you know you have to follow through with the punishment. And then about an hour later, you hear him crying and whimpering in his room, and he wants, says, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And so you tell him, well, if you, if you come out and clean up your mess and say you're sorry, then we'll give you some food. And so you were able to carry out the punishment and he was able to repent and you were able to forgive him, but you didn't really carry out the full punishment of making him go the whole night without food. And God has a similar quandary in that he loves us, wants to be gracious to us, but when he said the penalty of sin is death, he has to carry out that penalty as well. And you can't partially kill someone. You can partially punish in other ways, but death is either death or it's not death. And the death that the Lord was talking about with Adam and Eve was not only a physical death, they began to die physically, but it was a spiritual death. That day they were spiritually separated from the Lord, had to leave the Garden of Eden. And there's an eternal death where we're eternally separated from the love of God. <clears throat> so Adam and Eve were not put to death that day physically, but spiritually they died. And so the Lord covered their sin and shame by killing some animals and using the skins to make coverings for Adam and Eve. And from that time on, it became customary to sacrifice the blood of animals to atone for the sins of men and women. Just like when God took the Jews from Egypt and he commanded them before they were going to leave Egypt that they had to sacrifice a lamb, kill a lamb, and put some of the blood on the doorposts of their homes. And then they were supposed to roast that lamb. They had barbecued lamb chops that night. And all of the homes that had blood of the lamb on them, the destroying angel that came through Egypt passed over their homes, and no one in their homes was killed. But all of the homes that did not have the blood of the lamb, the oldest, oldest child in the home was passed away. And then after this, when they left Egypt and went into the wilderness, the Lord gave Moses all the ceremonial laws and sacrificial laws and there were many different kinds of sacrifices to cover the sins of the Jews. 
And in Leviticus 1711, it says, For the life of the blood, life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And then in Hebrews 9.22, it says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But then Hebrews goes on to say in Hebrews 10.4, It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had suffered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So the writer in Hebrews is making the argument that the sacrifices of animals by the Jews from the time of Moses's time of Moses to the death of Jesus would cover and atone for the sins of that day, of that month, that year, but they could not totally remove the curse and the penalty of sin. But Jesus, the perfect offering, the one-time offering for sin, has the power to take away all sin for all people for all time. So why did Jesus have to die? Well, someone had to die, and it had to be someone who didn't deserve to die for their own sins. So it had to be a person and not an animal, and it had to be a person without any sin, without any defect, and only Jesus fit that description. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he, God the Father, made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. And this is really the great exchange that Jesus has created. Jesus was sinless. He became sin. In other words, Jesus never committed any sin, but he was considered to be guilty of every sin that's ever been committed by mankind. So that we who are sinful might then become righteous in God's eyes, like Jesus is, if we are in Christ by faith. This is an incredible thought and probably beyond our comprehension, but still people will ask, okay, so Jesus had to be sacrificed, but why did it have to be such a horrible, cruel death on a cross? Well, think about how many sins you've created in your lifetime, or how many you've committed in your lifetime, harsh words, lies, pride, neglecting others' needs, and think how angry you get when you see injustices or cruelty, or when you hear about children being abducted and abused and killed, or think about the lynchings that have taken place in America, or the Jews that were killed in World War II by the Nazis or all of the millions who were killed by the communists in Russia and China. All of these sins, all of these horrible sins were put on Jesus. And horrible sins deserve horrible punishment. And many of the sins in the book of Moses, the laws of Moses, carried the penalty of death, uh, including murder, adultery, and even cursing your mother and father was punishable by death, by stoning. So, looking at our passage for today, Galatians 3.10 says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, this verse is quoting from Deuteronomy 27, 26, the last book of the book of Mos- books of Moses. And it says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people said, Amen. So, they were cursed if they said, we're going to abide 
by all of these laws, and then they did not. And that Hebrew word for cursed is arar, which means a declaration of punishment or condemnation or uh, declaring you guilty of breaking the law or to ban or immobilize you. So to be cursed by God meant that you were declared guilty, deserving of punishment, and would be banned from God's family. <clears throat> but then go, Paul goes on to explain in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. And this quote comes from uh, Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, where it says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the day, the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land and the Lord your God, who's giving you this inheritance. The word for cursed in the Hebrew is kelala, which means removed from God's grace or his election. So in the times of Moses, as I said, many crimes were punishable by death, and it was usually death by stoning. But sometimes, as a warning to others, they would hang the body of the person who had been killed on a tree so that others would take note and be afraid to commit that same crime. <clears throat> So when did crucifixion come about? It did not exist during the times of Moses or of David or Solomon. In fact, the Jews never practiced crucifixion. It's generally believed that crucifixion was first practiced by the Babylonians around 600 BC during the time of uh, Isaiah and Daniel. And Darius, the king of the Babylonians, is said to have crucified around 3,000 inhabitants of Babylon. Crucifixion from that time then spread to the Assyrians, people of India, Germans, Celts, Brits, Greeks, and Macedonians, and then was adopted by the Romans. And they, the Romans primarily used crucifixion as a punishment for traitors, deserters, foreigners who were despised enemies, captive armies, slaves, violent criminals, and those guilty of treason. But then the first Christian Roman emperor in the 4th century AD, Constantine the Great, abolished crucifixion across the Roman Empire out of veneration for Christ. But crucifixion has reared its ugly head again and again over the years. It came back during the days of Islam, and then in Japan, around 1500 A.D., where 26 Christians were martyred in Nagasaki, put on crosses. Many of them were put on crosses out in the ocean, and the high tide then killed them. Crucifixion was not outlawed in Japan until 1871. And crucifixion is still being done in some Muslim countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia in 2014, and by ISIS 2015. But crucifixion by the Romans was especially cruel as they would whip and scourge the person to be crucified, and then they were made to carry their own crossbar to a place of execution. And it was a combination of torture and execution and humiliation for the purpose of it was to be a stark warning to everybody in the public that they better not commit the same crimes. <clears throat> Crucifixion was a slow, humiliating, cruel way to die, and the person was usually stripped naked, and the cause of death was usually asphyxiation, cardiac rupture, pulmonary embolism, or just a lack of blood and dehydration. So, why did Jesus have to suffer such a cruel death? Well, Jesus' death, I think there's about four reasons that I 
came up with. And the first one is that Jesus' death had to clearly be seen as a punishment and an execution for high crimes. His death couldn't be just seen as a natural death or as an accident or a heart attack from climbing a hill. Because it says in Isaiah 53, people needed to see that Jesus was paying the penalty for some awful crimes. Little did they know that they, they thought he was paying the penalty for his own crime, but he was paying the penalty for their crimes. In Isaiah 53, 3, it says, The Messiah was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one with whom their men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. As Paul says in Galatians 3, that anyone hanged on a tree is considered cursed and condemned, punished by God. And that's what the people thought when they saw Jesus on the cross. And that's what Isaiah was prophesying about. And they were correct. He was being punished for high crimes. But it was not his crimes. It was our crimes. And God had forsaken him. He was, at that moment on the cross, he was smitten by God and forsaken by God just as the worst and vile criminal would be. But the second thing I noticed, realized, is that Jesus' death had to be public and well documented. People had to be witnesses to Jesus' death. Otherwise, no one would believe that the resurrection was real. Probably hundreds of people saw Jesus die, and it was confirmed by the Roman soldiers. No one could claim that Jesus never really died. And I think a public execution is probably the only way to guarantee that there would be many witnesses to a person's death. For example, if, if Jesus had just died while walking up the Mount of Olives, had a heart attack, you know, and Peter tried to tell the crowds, well, Jesus had a heart attack while he was going up the Mount of Olives, but it was a punishment from God, and God raised him up three days later. Well, where were the other witnesses? Who saw that happen? And how do you know it was a punishment from God if he just had a heart attack? So it really had to be, as Isaiah wrote it, it had to be a punishment for a crime that was seen by many so that it would be well documented. And just thinking about how Jesus died on the cross, you know, he bled from the crown of thorns on his head, from the nails through his hands and feet, through the scourging, and through the piercing in his side from the sword. Jesus probably did not have much blood left in him. And the Bible says the life is in the blood. And so it would be easy to prove that Jesus really did die and that he couldn't have just been raised up, you know, drink some water, get a rest, and, uh, and come back to life. And then Jesus also had to be the perfect Passover lamb to fulfill the prophecies of passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 so that everyone would know that Jesus was the one spoken of in the Old Testament, that he was the one that was going to take the punishment we deserved. And just as each year the Jewish families would sacrifice a lamb to God to celebrate the Passover, and in that celebration, they were celebrating that God had given them freedom and new life. <clears throat> and Jesus died on the Passover because he became the perfect Passover lamb to take away our sins and give us new life and freedom. As it says in Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. 
And finally, his public execution made it easier to prove that the resurrection was real. <clears throat> As I said, people would have seen how much blood he had lost and how he was proven dead by the soldiers and that God miraculously raised him back to life three days later. He was, his body was in such a state that he could not have just been revived by natural means. And I believe that is, that is why Jesus had to suffer such a cruel death because it was prophesied and had to be fulfilled as written because it had to be public with many witnesses and it had to be a certainty that he really had died and really was stricken and cursed of the Lord for our transgressions. The amazing plans of God finding a way to keep his word that sin must be punished by death and yet finding a way for us to be forgiven by putting our faith in the one who died for us. And doing that at Passover 2,000 years ago, just thinking about it, should cause us to fall to our knees and want to worship the Lord. I wanted to just finish with this final illustration that I heard at the recent uh, RJC conference, Reaching Japanese for Christ. Because uh, this pastor said that he's often asked by Japanese people, why did Jesus have to die? Why, why can't God just forgive sins without having to shed blood? And so he reminds them of the sakura, the cherry blossoms. When the cherry blossoms start to bloom and are falling from the trees, it's considered the most beautiful time of the year, which is right now, as I saw in the news. The sakura have been blooming in Tokyo. But it's also considered a sad time. Many Japanese songs, including even J-pop songs, have sakura in their themes. And it's often a theme about a broken relationship that was a beautiful relationship, but it's fading away like the leaves falling from the cherry blossom, cherry trees. And the sakura are a symbol of beauty and love and sadness. And as soon as the blossoms fall away, there's new life on the tree as the green leaves appear. If the beautiful sakura does not die and fall to the ground, the new life in the leaves cannot appear. In the same way, Jesus was a perfect, loving, beautiful reincarnation of God who had to die, and it caused much sadness as his life blood dripped to the ground. But on Sunday morning, new life sprang from the grave and took away all the sadness of that previous Friday. Jesus is alive. And if you believe Jesus died for you and is Lord of heaven and earth and rose from the dead, then you too are alive for eternity. So I hope you'll sing along with the video uh, that the link is on this um, email that I sent you. When I survey the wondrous cross, and please think about the beautiful life on the cross fading away for you so that you can have new life. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift you up and praise you because we cannot comprehend what you had to go through in order to pay the penalty for our sins. We thank you, we worship you for sacrificing your life, for taking that pain and that punishment and that humiliation and shame in place of us. Lord, we worship you today. We also pray, Lord, for each one in our congregation that you would just protect them from evil and that you would protect them from this virus. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring an end to the spread of this virus and that you would guide the doctors and the governments in their decisions. And we also 
look forward to the day, Lord, when we can gather together with our brothers and sisters and celebrate together the wonderful things that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.